This program contains images of the use of the Chlorine Institute's emergency kits A, B, and C in training exercises. For the purpose of clarity in illustrating the use of the kit devices, the first responders depicted are not wearing proper personal protective equipment. Always wear protective gear and ensure proper fit and protection before responding to any chlorine emergency. First responders today are presented with a whole host of challenges on a daily basis. It can range from learning new techniques or equipment, maintaining existing equipment, dealing with budgetary or manpower issues, and not the least of which are the incident calls you field all day and all night long. As a first responder, you know that the first 15 minutes of a response is critical to a successful outcome of the situation. Proper planning and preparation before an incident and the amount and quality of information you quickly gather during the incident will be imperative to the safety of yourself, your team, and the public. This program was developed to help you prepare to act in those critical first 15 minutes. What to do when the call comes in and what you might expect on scene and where to find the resources you'll need to contain it. And while this video illustrates specifically a chlorine release, the techniques and workflow presented are valuable in just about any type of hazmat response. This DVD is divided into two main components, an overview of emergency planning, what to do when the call comes in and what to do upon arrival on the scene, and tabs which provide more detailed information that expand on the overview. The DVD is set up with chapters, so if you're interrupted, you can go back where you left off or you can easily review specific sections. Let's first define who might be a first responder. Of course, it's the fire and rescue crew who often get the call first. But depending on the nature and location of the incident, the first responder might be police, a medical team, or a hazmat team. This will be important to you during your response because you'll need to know who is already on scene and what resources are immediately available. An incident will take many forms, and nothing should be assumed or taken for granted, no matter how minor initial indications appear. Depending on your locale, chlorine-specific incidents may take the form of motor carrier accidents, train derailments, and incidents involving public infrastructure like a water treatment plant, a manufacturing plant, or even a public pool. But no matter what the situation might present, the adage that a best defense is a good offense applies. A comprehensive and clear emergency response plan is a critical component to any first response. We'll cover that plan in detail in this video, so let's begin. Chlorine use is widespread and essential to our way of life. Not only does chlorine chemistry help make our drinking water safer, it plays an essential role in producing pharmaceuticals, crop protection chemicals, semiconductors, and many products we use on a daily basis. But in spite of the fact that chlorine is all around us in tightly controlled uses, it is a potentially dangerous substance. Exposure to chlorine can cause respiratory distress and can be lethal at some concentrations. If chlorine or similar hazardous chemicals are suspected in an incident, it is critical to take appropriate action, guided by effective and careful planning to protect yourself, your team, and the general public. Depending on your locale and organizational size, the resources available to you may be limited or far away. Recognizing this will help you develop an effective emergency response plan that fits your situation. Responders need to be prepared to work within the National Incident Management System, which is a unified approach to incident command. For example, rural organizations may have personnel who have to wear many hats, may not have specialized hazmat response training or equipment, and the nearest hazmat response team may be hours away. Small city organizations may have more personnel, which may allow for more specialized duties, but still may need to rely on other resources for specific incident containment. Large city organizations may have the luxury of dedicated hazmat teams and larger staff with specialized duties, but resources may be stretched thin due to several simultaneous incidents, heightened security alerts, budget restrictions, and more. Based on your organization's makeup, you should have a clear plan for contacting those chlorine response resources available to you in the event of an incident. These resources will include other fire response departments, state and local response agencies, and private contractors. 
we'll identify some of these agencies in this program. When a call comes in when we're en route, probably the first thing that's, a, that's running through my mind, oddly, is um, trying to evaluate is whether or not it's, it's what we call a bug hunt whether or not it's a real call where there's really chemicals being released or it's just somebody that smelled something that they thought was unusual and, and it, it's really nothing. So we're trying to evaluate that along the way. When the emergency call comes in, of course you need to obtain as much information as possible to accurately assess the situation. Your mindset should be focused on gathering the answers to these questions. What are the facts about the incident? Is there a visible cloud? Are there any odors? What is the wind direction? What are my immediate resources? Who can I call for help? How should I protect myself, my team, and the public? What are the likely outcomes of the incident? What do I do if civilians are involved? What is likely to happen if my crew rushes in without proper preparation? What can I do to prevent further damage? How does our response time affect the incident? Bottom line, can I respond safely? And if I can't, who can I call to help me? At this point, you cannot rule out any potential hazard, but there are specific indicators that might suggest the incident is chlorine-based in nature, including where is the location of the incident? If it's an industrial or public utilities location, chlorine may be present on site and thus involved. If the incident involves motor vehicles, what kind of vehicles are involved? Bulk chlorine is transported in cargo tanks, which are recognizable as they are pressure vessels. Cylinders and ton containers are transported in both enclosed or open vehicles and trailers. If the incident is a derailment, the types of cars involved is a good indication of the volatility of the incident. Chlorine is only transported by rail in pressure tank cars. By obtaining as many facts about the incident as possible within reasonable response time, the better you'll be prepared when you arrive on site. Your pre-emergency plan should identify which resources are potentially available to you and include backup plans if those resources are not immediately available. Even if chlorine is not involved in the incident, there may be equally volatile and dangerous hazardous chemicals involved. Nothing should be assumed. Uh, first responders' mindset uh, in route should be that they don't want to be part of the problem to arrive upwind, isolate the area and deny entry, get information that they need to evaluate whether, whether or not it's a real incident, what the product is. It's extremely difficult to resist rushing in, but still we see that happen time and time again in the real world. Those first responders become part of our problem. Nothing should be taken for granted during an emergency response, but by the time you deploy to the accident site, you should have a fairly clear indication of the nature of the incident from the preliminary information you gathered during the intake call. At least you may have an indication of the likelihood that chlorine is involved. At this point, you should have a general awareness of the situation, but there may be unknown chemicals at the scene that may be an inhalation hazard or pose other hazards. Be alert to the wind direction and odors. When we first approach the scene, uh, we're usually evaluating lots of, of little clues. If we see a large plume of colored, unusually colored vapors, that usually tells us that there's really a release. If we see people behaving uh, unusually, um, absence of insect activity, uh, we look for birds. Birds are really good at an indicator for us. Um, if we see unusual things along that, that will make us change our response completely and really hold off from our entry. One of the most important protective measures you take is the proper use of personal protective equipment, or PPE. The nature of the incident will determine what level of PPE you should use. These precautionary measures will not only protect yourself, but also your team and enhance your ability to respond to the incident. Your pre-emergency plan would have identified on-site personnel roles, lines of authority, and communication networks. The chain of command should be immediately established upon arriving at the incident site. Now is a good time to go over these preparatory tasks. Protecting the public is also key to a successful outcome and proper emergency alerting and response procedures should be in place and ready for implementation. You should be prepared to initiate the notification system, including reverse 911, door-to-door -door alerts, and other procedures. As you approach the site, identifying the nature of the contents of containers is critical. 
Fortunately, there are a number of indicators that help. Placards on vehicles, UN numbers, stencils on containers, way bills, bills of lading, and others. By being alert and gathering this information, you may be able to identify the contents of the containers involved in the incident. Other tools available to you. ERG guides, which provide further information. The Wireless Information System for Emergency Responders, or WISER, is a free PDA-based resource that provides a wide range of information on hazardous substances, including identification support, physical characteristics, health information, and containment advice. Not only will these tools help you identify the contents, but also the impact of a large spill or a small spill. There are specific indicators that will alert you that chlorine is involved. Chlorine is transported as a compressed, liquefied gas in 150-pound cylinders, 1-ton containers, 20-ton cargo tanks, 55 or 90-ton railed tank cars and barges. Chlorine is placarded UN 1017 for easy identification. Chlorine is typically loaded in a refrigerated state with a pressure between 40 and 80 PSIG. Chlorine is a gas at atmospheric pressure and temperatures above minus 29 degrees Fahrenheit. So if there's a release from a chlorine container, chances are it will be a gas cloud. Even if liquid chlorine is released from a container, the heat from the atmosphere and the ground will cause the chlorine to boil and turn into a gas almost immediately. At lower concentrations, the gas will be a faint yellowish color. At higher concentrations, it will be a greenish yellow to green in color. It is important to remember that gaseous chlorine is heavier than air, so it will settle in low areas such as basements, creek beds, ditches, sewers, and ravines. Chlorine has a strong bleach-like odor, but it's important to know that commercial chlorine and bleach are not the same, and their effects are very different. Bleach is placarded different from chlorine. Chlorine is much stronger than bleach, and the effects of chlorine exposure can be far more lethal. When we arrive, we usually see that, that uh, people that have been poorly trained or never received any training, um, they try and help. And so that what they end up doing is, is uh, entering the scene, they end up getting contaminated along with the victims, and then we end up having to decontaminate them uh, along with the victims as well. Um, it is the hardest thing for a first responder to not uh, make entry into the area and, and, and try and save somebody. The very best thing that you can do is isolate the area and deny entry. It's tough, but you got to do it. When your team arrives at the incident site, it's time to put your emergency plan into action. Depending on your resources available to you, your personnel and equipment, several things should happen simultaneously to contain the incident. Establish incident command, establish safe zones and hot zones, secure the site, evacuate and treat victims, and monitor the air. Upon arriving at the site, establish a buffer zone around the site to secure and maintain public safety. Since the release may involve a gas cloud, consider wind direction when establishing this zone. The first step after setting up the buffer zone is to don proper PPE for a site assessment. Use of binoculars is sometimes helpful to identify leak sources. Don't rush in without properly trained personnel. After the initial site assessment, set up an action plan. Do not spray the site with water, as it may make the chlorine release worse. Water reacts with chlorine to produce corrosive acid. Constant monitoring of wind speed, condition and direction, and if available chlorine levels, is necessary to maintain the buffer zone and guide the containment process. Places of shelter will need to be established at a safe distance from the release. These areas will be incident specific. The size and severity of the spill will determine where the safe distance zone will be located so that exposure to the release will not occur. This shelter is not only the staging area, but also a resting place for responders, so water and first aid supplies should be present. The command post should be located separate from the shelter area in order to facilitate an effective response. But it's important to make sure that it and the command post is mobile in case the refuge has to be moved quickly due to a shifting gas cloud or other reason. Site security is also critical. Work zones need to be established. Designated hot, warm, and cold. Control over who enters the hazardous areas must be tightly monitored by an on-site safety officer and appropriate medical monitoring must be determined and carried out. Be alert to the possibility that the incident is a terrorist or criminal act 
and be cautious. There may be secondary devices or acts perpetrated during the course of the response. If you find evidence, try to protect it for investigators. Responders should be aware that some tank cars are equipped with tracking devices or similar devices that may look suspicious. Assure that Chemtrek or Canutech has been activated. In the U.S., the Chemical Transportation Emergency Center, or Chemtrek, provides immediate advice to you at the scene 24-7 and will in turn immediately contact the appropriate responder group as required. In some cases, it will be the shipper, but Chemtrek will also activate the Chlorine Emergency Plan, or Chlorep. Chlorep is an industry-wide emergency plan that includes trained emergency teams located throughout the U.S. and Canada. These teams are on a 24-hour alert to provide assistance and technical support so the first responders can properly handle chlorine releases. The Canadian Transport Emergency Center, or Canutech, is the Canadian dispatch agency and operates very much like Chemtrek in the U.S. In Mexico, the Emergency Transportation System for the Chemical Industry, or CETIC, is the dispatch agency and operates much like Chemtrek and Canutech. Make sure you keep these organizations' phone numbers readily accessible at all times. You should also request Material Safety Data Sheets, or an MSDS, from Chemtrek. When calling in a report, always leave a callback number to allow for contacting. Finally, evacuation routes and procedures should be implemented. These procedures will include primary evacuation routes as well as alternative exit routes. Vehicles used in the evacuation should be staged and ready to go. Plans for an alternative command post location should be addressed. The default answer for hazardous materials response is isolate and deny entry. If you don't have information, you don't know what the product is, you don't know how bad it is, you can't go wrong by isolating the area and denying entry to any other people. That way nobody else goes into the area, nobody else gets contaminated, nobody else has any toxic effects. And you also deny exit. None of the contaminated people are allowed to come out. Isolate and deny entry is the, is the watchword for hazardous. If you do that, you, uh, your problems will shrink to practically nothing. Once the command post has been established, emergency medical treatment, first aid procedures, and decontamination procedures should be implemented. Identify an area where first aid will be provided. This can be the refuge area or another safe area. You should have on-hand information about the whereabouts and availability of the nearest trauma center. There should also be a liaison between your emergency response team and the local medical personnel on scene who should keep the local hospitals appraised of the situation. A decontamination zone needs to be established that provides adequate protection for medical personnel. The type of decontamination protocol used will be dependent upon the specific type of release. Your decontamination plan will also identify methods for disposing of contaminated protective equipment. It is important to remember that anything or anyone entering the hot zone is considered to be contaminated and must be decontaminated when leaving that zone. Of course, the best approach to decontamination is to make every effort to avoid contamination in the first place. If chlorine comes in contact with combustible substances, explosions and fires may result. The most common way for chlorine to come in contact with incompatible substances is through spills, releases, and container failures. Mitigation of the incident begins with the containment of the release. If the leak is in a cylinder that you can safely maneuver, rotate the cylinder so that the leak is on top of the container. Liquid will be on the bottom of the cylinder and gas will be on the top. If you have access to and are trained in the proper use of the Chlorine Institute's emergency kits A, B, or C, use them to contain the leak. Be sure to determine the pressure of the cylinder or container prior to application of any kit. After every significant incident, we do a review uh, and a debrief with all the particular players that were necessary at the, at the call. And we'll go over the things that we did right and the things that we did wrong. Um, it's really tough to not dwell on the things that you did right because everybody likes to pat themselves on the back. Uh, we tend more to look at the things that we didn't do wrong, so we'll never do those again. Um, just by doing that, every time we go to a real incident, we identify something, the next call ends up going smoother. This critique should provide an open forum for discussion of the actions that went right 
and those that went wrong during the response. Follow-up procedures should include restocking supplies that were used during the response and cleaning, repair, or replacement of emergency equipment. Finally, assign action items for those that need improvement. A meaningful follow-up critique will allow for continual improvement of the response process. Well, my personal definition of success at a hazmat incident is probably a little different from others. For me, it means that my crew goes home in the morning uh, intact and healthy. Um, and so when we approach a hazardous materials incident, uh, we try and keep our own safety paramount. Now, if we get contaminated or injured, then nobody else can get helped also. We've covered a lot of material here, and as you can see, there are many facets to an emergency response that will ensure a successful outcome. As we said, this program specifically addresses chlorine release emergencies, but the planning, preparation, and response procedures demonstrated, and the awareness that you will need to possess throughout each step of a response, are applicable to just about any type of incident and will help ensure the protection and safety of yourself, your team, and the public. We reserve much of the details of the information we presented here for the special tab section of this DVD, where you can find more in-depth information on a variety of topics discussed. Take some time to go through that section. Information is a valuable tool during a response, and the more knowledge you have about potentially dangerous situations, the better prepared you are for the unknowns. I have the best job in the world. I really do. If I hit it big on the, on the lottery, I would still do this job. It's like family here. I have a wonderful crew. Uh, we all watch each other's backs. It's really heartwarming to see uh, the thank yous that you get from people. It's fun doing, uh, it's a fun job and, and it's uh, very rewarding. I can't imagine doing anything else. I feel sorry for the rest of the people that, that don't have this job. Mm-hmm.